Hello, my name is Dr. Allison Ames Boykin. I'm an assistant professor in the Educational Statistics and Research Methods program. I'm presenting the Introduction to SAS workshop video today. We presented this workshop initially both in person and online, and we're re-recording the workshop in order to address questions that came up in both the in-person and online workshops. Our goal today is to begin with data vocabulary. Then we'll move into SAS basics, including reading in data files and some selected statistical procedures. We'll also talk about data manipulation and subsetting of the data, and we'll show some data visualization techniques. If you want to access SAS for your own personal computer, you can obtain a copy of SAS for a Windows operating system through the University of Arkansas. There's also a remote virtual desktop where instead of downloading software to your own machine, you'll log in to the virtual desktop and use that machine, SAS. There's also SAS University Edition. Now this is compatible with any operating system, so you can use it with the Mac. It is web-based, and so you'll need to have the internet in order to access the University Edition. There are multiple labs on campus that have software uh, downloaded on those computers. One of those labs is in the Graduate Education Building on the third floor. We'll begin with some basic data vocabulary. First is observation or case. And this is the unit of analysis or an individual. We tend to think of one observation per row or one person per row. In the tables below you can see that an observation can have both numeric data, such as height, or categorical data, such as their name and subject. In the first set of data on the left-hand side, we have four observations. We also have four observations on the right-hand side, even though there are more columns in the data set. Each column represents a variable or an attribute of that observation. On the left-hand side, we have one variable per individual, or one measurement for each individual. Here, on the left-hand side, that's height. On the right-hand side, we have three variables, name, subject, and score. We typically don't count the row number as a variable, but if you had a unique identifier in your data set, such as student ID or social security number, then that might be considered a variable. First, I'll highlight the quantitative variables or numeric variables in our data set. These are height and score. Now these can take on ordinal values, they can take on ratio values, but they're quantitative in nature. Next, we have string or character variables. These are, these are themes like name or subject matter, and they typically have letters, but they don't have to. When we put this all together with observations in rows and variables in columns, we end up with a data set or data file. This is the most common way to organize our data with observations in rows and the variables in columns. And this is how SAS and most other software um, are going to want your data formatted. There are many different types of files, and the first type is a flat file that we'll discuss. These include plain text files with no formatting, and they have both rows and columns. One of the nice features about flat files is that they contain less storage space, so they're useful for very large data sets. Some of the common flat file extensions that you may be familiar with are .csv, which stands for comma-separated values, .dat, and .txt. .dat and .txt files are commonly opened in something like Notepad, whereas .csv files are commonly opened in something like Microsoft Excel. On the right-hand side of your screen, we see different types of delimited files. At the top, we see a space-delimited file, where each column is separated by a space. In the middle, we have comma-delimited files. Now here, each column is separated by a comma instead of a space. 
Next up, we have tab delimited, where each column is separated by a tab. Structured files are our other type of file. They contain more storage space. They're also organized as rows and columns. And some of the common extensions that we see are .sav for SPSS files, uh, SAS7BDAT for SAS datasets, and XLSX and XLS for Excel files. Next up, we'll get an overview of SAS basics. When you open up SAS, this is what it will look like, and it will be organized like this always. The first thing that you'll see is your log window on the top, and it's labeled log. You'll also see your editor window at the bottom, and in your editor window is where you'll actually be typing in SAS commands. Finally, you see the Explorer window, and your Explorer window contains several different components. It contains your libraries, your file shortcuts, your favorite folders, and then the local computer that you're using. The log window provides a summary of what SAS is doing. This is in blue. If you see any green text in your log, that means a warning. It indicates that something might be wrong. Usually your program will run even if you have a warning. However, if you receive an error in red, that indicates that something is wrong. And the errors can help us figure out what exactly went wrong with our SAS program. The Explore tab, again, allows you to look at files. And then you see down next to the Explore tab at the bottom, the Results tab, so I'll draw an error to draw your attention to that, allows you to navigate through your output. Finally, we have the editor window, and this is where you'll type in your SAS commands or your syntax. Some more SAS basic terminology. An external file exists outside of SAS. So this could be a flat data file, such as those CSV files that we discussed. It could be an Excel file or a SAS permanent data set. And then there are temporary data sets. These exist only in SAS memory as long as the current SAS program is open. And that's the key. If you read in an external file and you manipulate that file, but then close SAS without saving that file, all the manipulations that you did to the data will be erased. And we'll show you today how to save those manipulations to your data set if you wish. There's some very basic SAS syntax rules. Each line of commands ends with a semicolon, and a group of commands are followed by the run command. SAS is not dependent on spacing, and it doesn't depend on capitalization either. There is one exception, and that is variable values, and we'll show you some of those examples today. Comments are ignored by the SAS program, so if you want to write yourself notes about what you're doing when you're writing your syntax, you can create a comment in one of two ways, by starting with an asterisk and ending with a semicolon, or by starting with a backslash and an asterisk and ending with the opposite, asterisk and then backslash. Everything that turns green will be ignored by SAS, and in that way, you can write comments to yourself or write notes to keep track of what you're doing. So let's see how to read in some common data file types. There are two primary ways to get data into SAS. The first is through manual entry, and the second is using the import procedure. One thing to note is that SAS has data steps and it has procedure steps. Now, a data step begins with the word data, and that's used to create a data set or manipulate a data set. Now, a procedure starts with the word PROC, which is short for procedure. And procedures do things like analyze your data sets or create output from your data. They're also used to import external files. We'll begin with manual entry of our data set. Manual entry starts with a data line. 
So we're going to create a data set called scores in this example. And this approach is helpful for small data sets, but you can imagine that if you have a thousand observations or a thousand variables, that you definitely wouldn't want to type in your data by hand. But if you have data that you found elsewhere, you can copy and paste it into SAS using this approach. And so for this reason, using a data step is pretty helpful for us. The first line of our syntax creates a data set called scores. Here, we're telling SAS that we're going to create a data set and we're going to name it scores. Next, we have an input line. Input tells SAS the names of our variables. So we're going to create a data set called scores that's going to be made up of variables ID, gender, and score. The dollar sign in this case tells SAS that gender is a character variable. That is, it has letters. Anytime we have letters in our variable, we need to tell SAS that it's going to be a character variable. And we do this using a dollar sign. If your variable is numeric, you don't need to tell SAS that. By default, it assumes all of our variables are numeric. After we've told SAS what our variables are, then we need to tell it that what comes next are our lines of data. So we use the words data lines. And notice that at the end of each statement, I have a semicolon. Next up, we have our actual data that we're going to input. It's shaded yellow and SAS does this for us by default. That's one of the nice features of SAS. Notice that we spelled data right and that we ended the line with a semicolon and so data turned blue. I'll show you what happens if you misspell one of the commands in SAS. And then when I'm done with my data, I put a semicolon to let SAS know that everything between data lines and a semicolon contains my lines of data. And then I tell SAS to run. Let's see that in SAS now. The font that I'm using is a little bit larger than the font that you're going to see when you open up SAS. And I've done that so that you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing and follow along. So if I had misspelled data, for instance, notice that it turns the word red. But once I spell it correctly, it turns back to blue. Typically, in your lines of syntax, things that are blue are pretty okay. Um, that means that you've spelled them correctly and they're generally in the right place. If we spell a word incorrectly or until the point that it's spelled correctly, SAS will turn it red or black so that it will let us know, hey, you're not quite typing this in correctly. So once I have my data command and I tell SAS what my variables are, next comes my data lines, and by default, SAS turns this yellow. That tells me that I'm on the right track. Now, once I've written my commands, in order to get this data set created, I'm going to select the entire set of code. And then up at the top, you'll see this little running man. And if I ho hover over it, that says submit. Anything that's highlighted, when I hit submit, that will run it for me in SAS. And notice that in my log window, I now have two notes and they're blue and that tells me that everything is okay. If I read them, it says the data set work.scores has five observations and three variables and that the data statement used 0.11 seconds. Now you might be saying, why does it say work.scores when we only named it scores? Well, work tells you the folder where your data is located. So if you go to libraries, you'll see several different folders by default, and one that will always be there is work. This is your temporary folder. All of your temporary data sets will be placed in the work folder. Now, if I wanted to save the scores data set, I would need to do that because otherwise, whenever I close out this session of SAS, I'm going to lose that data set. So we'll show you at the end how to save your permanent SAS data sets. 
If I wanted to see this data set, I could do two, one of two things. I could just double click on the data set and look at the table. Or I could use a procedure. I could run proc print. I need to tell it which data set I want to print and then run. So here I've told SAS to use the print procedure on the data set scores. And then I want to run that command. So I highlight the two lines of code that I want to run and submit. And then in my results window, I now have my printed data set. Also on the left hand side, you'll see what's called a results tree. For all of the output that gets created today, I'll be able to navigate to that specific output on the left hand side. And this becomes useful if you're running many procedures at once. Another useful procedure that we'll demonstrate is the contents procedure. Now proc contents tells you what is, what are the variables and other attributes of your data set. So if I type proc contents data equals scores and then run, I'm telling SAS to perform the contents procedure on the data set scores. Again, I'll highlight and then submit. And notice that SAS labels my output. So it tells me that everything below this came from the contents procedure. Here, it tells me that I have five observations in my data set and that I have three variables. I usually like to check this kind of information to make sure that I've created the data set correctly. At the bottom, it gives me an alphabetic list of the variables and their variable attributes. So here I can see that there are three variables. Gender is a character variable, ID is numeric, and score is numeric. Now in the PowerPoint that we provide, there are several learning checks for you to practice on your own. For each learning check in the slide immediately following, we provide the solution to the learning check. So for each of the learning checks, I encourage you to pause the video and see if you can answer the learning check on your own. This would be a great way to reinforce your knowledge and get a deeper understanding of the material that we're presenting. Now that we know how to enter data manually, let's see how to import an external data file. This is more helpful for us because most often the data that we work with is going to be stored in either an Excel file or an SPSS file or some other external data set type. And we're going to be able to use PROC import to import Excel files, CSV files, DAT files, and so on. Here's an example of some PROC import code on the right hand side. I'll walk you through each of the different pieces of this code. So here's our code. Notice that uh, there's no semicolon until after the word out. Now I initially told you that we would put a semicolon at the end of each line. The reason that there's no semicolon until out is because technically this could all be on one line but we've just put it on separate lines to illustrate the different components that go along with it. See, we could stretch it out so that it's all on one line for you. The data file tells SAS the location of the external data file, and you need to correctly copy and paste the path of the entire data file. I'll show you how to do that right now. So if you go to wherever your data set is, and here we're using the grit.xlsx data file, if I click on that file one time and go to copy path, then I'm able to copy and paste the entire data file path into SAS. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start typing proc import data file equals and then I can paste my entire path. Now, the nice thing about using that copy path feature 
again, it's up here at the top in the top left-hand corner. The nice thing about that feature is that it prevents you from misspelling any of the uh, parts of the path, particularly if you have a very long path. So once we tell SAS the location of the external data file, we need to tell it the database management system. Now this DBMS or specifies the database management system. And one thing to note is that whatever the extension of your file is, so here the extension, the very end is .xlsx, that's what we put in the DBMS. So it's an Excel file and we're telling SAS that go to this location and what you'll be reading in is an XLSX file. Then we can use the word replace. That replaces an existing data set. Now, replace is optional, but it might be good practice for you to start including it. Because if you're going to be manipulating data sets and let's say that you mess up and you want to start over, then you would want to replace the existing data set that you messed up with. The out equals is what you're going to name your output data set. So we're taking an external file, we're reading it into SAS for use in SAS, and we need to give it a name so that we can refer to it when we're using it in SAS. Here we're going to name it grit1, and I've put a 1 on the end to distinguish it from the name of the original file. Here I have git names equals yes. That's just telling us that the first row of my data set contains variable names, and I would like you to read those in as variable names. So let's try it out. Now that I have my data file path, I also need to tell SAS what the DBMS is. Here, it's an XLSX file. Remember, I also need to tell it what the output data set name is, and I'm going to call it GRIT1. Finally, I might want to tell it REPLACE. So then I'm going to highlight all of this, hit SUBMIT, and it says the import data set has 300 observations and 18 variables work.grit1 was successfully created. So that's a great feeling when everything turns out blue and it tells us that our data set was successfully created. Now we could look at some rows of that data if we wanted to. We could do proc print data equals grit1, but because it has 300 observations, I might not want to print all 300 observations out. I might only want to print 10, for example. So in parentheses, I would say obs equals 10. That would tell SAS to use the print procedure on the GRIT1 data set, but only the first 10 observations. And again, I need to tell it to run. I highlight that, I hit submit, and the first 10 rows of my data set are printed out. Now I can see that there are 12 variables, I1 through I12, there's a variable edu for education level, gender, age, whether they're um, urban or not. So there's urban, suburban, and rural. And then we have a pretest and a midtest. So I can start to get to know my data in this way by using that proc print statement. So how do we read in other data files? Well, we can read in multiple other data set types using the same formula, using the PROC import. So now let's say that I wanted to read in that grit comma dot CSV data set. I would simply change the path because now I need to point to the correct data set. And I would also need to change my DBMS statement because now I'm no longer reading in an Excel file, I'm reading in a file that has the .csv extension or commerce separated value. So I need to change the path and change the DBMS, but everything else is pretty much the same. 
If I want to read it in an SPSS file, I do the same thing. I change the path to whatever SPSS file I want to read in, and then I use dbms equals sav because the extension is .sav. Notice that there's no git names command for SPSS files. That's because by default, the metadata in SPSS will tell SAS, hey, this first row contains variable names. For delimited or flat files, I can add DLM into the DBMS statement. So here's an example of importing a .dat file. My DBMS needs to say DLM. I'm going to replace that. The out statement still stays the same. Now I just need to figure out what kind of delimiter I have and tell SAS that. So delimiter equals, if it's space delimited, I would have quotation, space, quotation. If it's comma delimited, I would have quotation, comma, quotation. If it's tab delimited, I would have quotation, 09 quotation x. And here the get names command is optional. That's if your first row contains variable names or not. So you have access to this big five data set that we've sent you. See if you can use proc import to read that data set in and see if you can figure out how many observations and variables are in that data file. And then try to print out the first five observations. Now that we know how to read in our SAS or our external data files, let's see how to use those data files for some st selected statistical procedures. First up is the frequency procedure, or PROC FREQ, short for frequency. The frequency procedure provides percentages of each category. We can also use it to provide contingency tables. So for example, if we want to look at the cross tabulation between two variables, we can create a two-way contingency table. We can also do tests and measures of association for categorical variables, such as Pearson's chi-square test, Fisher's exact test, relative risk, and so on. The way that we do this is with the frequency procedure. So remember, we said that anything that begins with PROC is a procedure that is operating on a data set. So here we're going to use, we're telling SAS to use the frequency procedure on the data set GRIT1, and I want to create a frequency table for that EDU variable. So let's look at an example of that in SAS. I'm going to use proc freak data equals grit1 tables edu and then run. I highlight what I want to submit and then I hit the little running man. Now you'll notice that SAS again labels this the frequency procedure and it tells me at the top that this is for the variable edu. In this output, I have education and each level of that education variable, zero through four. Then I have simple frequencies or counts. What this column is telling me is that I have two individuals with education level zero, 35 individuals with education level one, 134 with education level two, and so on. Then I also have a percent column. This gives me the percent out of the total. I know that there are 300 individuals in this data set, and I know that because when I read in the data, I double checked and it said that there were 300 observations. So this percent is computed as the frequency divided by the total number of individuals. In this case, for the education level zero, two divided by 300 is 0 0.67. I also have cumulative frequencies and cumulative percents. I might
might also want to create a contingency table, or what we commonly refer to as a cross tabs. Here, I want to see the two-way contingency table between education and urban. And the way that I do that is using an asterisk in between my, the two variables that I want to create a table for. So here, I would just add asterisk urban, and I would get a two-way contingency on the right-hand side. Now, this is a lot of output. I'm going to run this in SAS and explain it to you. I'm just going to manipulate my code and add urban. Remember that I said that we can add in comments if we want to using backslash asterisk. So I'm just going to make a note to myself that the asterisk creates contingency tables. This way, when I go back and look at my code in the future, I have a note to myself that's reminding me what I'm doing. And again, I'm gonna highlight this and notice that SAS will ignore anything that's turned green as a comment. So you'll see now that I have a table that has a lot of numbers in it and it might not be that intuitive to follow. So let me walk you through what each number represents. I have my cell distribution and so in here is my two-way contingency table. On the far right column and the bottom row are my marginal distributions. These are the distributions of that variable, ignoring the other variable. So if you look above, we see 2, 35, 134. Here I see 2, 35, 134. So my far right column gives me the distribution of education regardless of urban. And then in the bottom column, I have the distribution of urban regardless of education. Next up, I have four numbers in each cell. So I'm gonna take this cell that I'm circling in green and walk you through what these numbers represent. SAS tells me what they represent in this table to the left. And that's one of the nice features of SAS is that if you know where to look, they do a pretty good job of labeling their output. So it's telling me that in this cell, the first row is the frequency. That means for education level one and, edu and urban level zero, there is one individual. Next up is percent. That's telling me that that one person is 0.33% of the entire data set. And in fact, if I take one divided by 300, that's 0.33 when I turn it into a percent. Next is the row percent. So that's telling me that of the people who have education level one, and that's 35 people, one of them is urban zero, and that's 2.86%. So that 2.86% comes from one divided by 35. Next up, we have the column percent. That's this number divided by the column total. One divided by one is 100%. Now, you might say that's a lot of output and it's more than I want. I want to get rid of the row percentages and the column percentages. And all I want to be left with are the frequencies. I could write no row, no column, and no percent. And these are going to get rid of the row percentages, the column percentages, and the overall percentages. When I run that, now you'll see that I'm just left with the two-way contingency table of frequencies. We could also ask for things like a chi-square statistic with the frequency procedure, and the command for that is just chi-square. And here we get the chi-square statistic with its degrees of freedom and its p-value. I'm not going to explain what a chi-square statistic does for us and what the null hypothesis is, uh, because here we're trying to focus just on SAS, um, 
But if you're interested in learning more about that, you can always uh, check in one of our classes in the ESRM department or come work with one of our tutors and even consult with one of our statistical measurement support services consultants. And I'll give you links for all of those at the end. Next up is the means procedure. Now PROC means does similar to what you think it might do. It runs means or provides descriptive statistics. Remember, a mean is just an average. And PROC means can perform these descriptions across all observations or even within a group of observations. The, the descriptive statistics that it calculates includes the mean, the standard deviation, it can compute skewness and kurtosis for you, it can estimate quantiles like the median, it can compute confidence limits, and so much more. So it's a really flexible procedure for us. At its most basic, if we just say PROC means data equals GRIT1, for the variable age, we'll get some default output. We'll get sample size. Here, it's telling me that there are 300 observations, that the average age is 25.43, that the standard deviation of age is 11.1, and that the minimum age in this data set is 1, and that the maximum age in this data set is 63. Now, I might ask for very specific statistics, and that might include things like skewness and kurtosis, and I might say, that's a lot of decimal places. I don't need all of those. Just give me two decimal places, and that's what max des equals. So when I run that output, I get exactly what I asked for. I get n, I get the mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, skewness, and kurtosis, all with only two decimal places. And here I've asked for multiple variables. I've asked for both age and pretest. So I can ask for as many variables as I want as long as they're numeric variables. If I tried to put in a character variable, SAS would give me an error message. I can also add a title to my output and I can create uh, summary statistics within each group. So here, this class statement defines urban as a classification variable. Another way to think of class or classification is defining it as a categorical variable. This is telling SAS that I have this variable urban. I want you to treat it as categorical or separate people into groups based on their value of urban. Then I'm going to ask for summary statistics on that pretest variable, and I'm going to give it a title. Here, title tells SAS that I want all of my output to have this title. And then when I'm ready to turn that title off, I just hit, I just type title again. So let's see an example of that output in SAS. PROC means data equals GRIT1. And I'm going to just ask for N, mean, skewness, and kurtosis, just for simplicity. And I will do max des equals 4, just to show you what that looks like, something different. In my class statement, I'm going to put urban. The variable that I'm working with is pretest. And I'm going to give it a title. I'm going to say, uh, these are my summary stats. And then I turn the title off. Finally, I'm going to choose to run. So I'll select that. I'll hit submit. And I put my title statement in the wrong place, so let me move that. I'm just going to put it above my PROC mean statement so that we can see it. And so what we see is um, for each level of urban, so 0, 1, 2, and 3, 
I have my number of observations, the mean, because remember, I only asked for the mean, and skewness and kurtosis. So I have the number of observations in, I have the mean or average, and then I have skewness and kurtosis. So I see that uh, for urban level zero, the average pretest score is 30. And SAS can't compute skewness and kurtosis because there's only one individual with urban level zero. So let's look at urban level three. I have 135 observations. Their average pretest score is 28.9185. And here I can see the skewness and kurtosis for that group. So here now I have summary statistics for each level of our grouping variable. So see if you can try out this learning check. Now we'll move on to the correlation procedure, PROC CORE. The correlation procedure provides both descriptive statistics and different correlation coefficients. The correlation procedure is implemented as follows. We ask SAS to perform the correlation procedure on the GRIT1 data set. And here I'm going to ask for a correlation between the pretest and the midtest scores. I can put as many variables as I want in this VAR statement as long as they're numeric variables. So if I had 10 other variables that I wanted to put in there, I could put 10 variables in. But here I'm just asking for the Pearson's correlation between pretest and midtest. When we look at our output, SAS tells us, okay, we had two variables, pretest and midtest. Here are some simple descriptive statistics for those two variables. And then here's our Pearson's correlation table. Again, SAS has labeled what's in the rows of that table. Notice that it tells me in the first row is the Pearson correlation coefficient, and that n equals 300. So if we come down here and we look at this cell that I'm highlighting in red, the first number is Pearson's correlation, R. And then SAS tells me that in the second row is the p-value, and it's evaluating the null hypothesis that the correlation in the population is zero. So this is our p-value. So here that we see that the correlation between mid-test and pre-test is 0.94728, or around 0.95, and then this value is statistically significantly different than zero, or for short, statistically significant. This is some really helpful ways that you can get output uh, if you wanna save it for another reason. So I'm gonna demonstrate this in SAS for you. I'm first going to run proc core or type out the commands for that. And let's say that I'm going to be using this uh, output later on, um, but that I don't have time to write up about it and that I might want to pull up my results on a different computer that doesn't have SAS. I could save this output as a Word document. And the way that I would do this is with ODS RTF and then ODS RTF close. Anything between these two statements is going to, the output will be put into a Word document. So if I highlight that and run it, Here's my correlation table. You can see that SAS created this uh, rich text format document that contains all of the output from Proc Core. Now I could put as many statements as I want in between the ODS and ODS RTF close. By default, SAS names that file SAS RTF. So let me just close that. And then I'll also put in that proc means 
and show you that it will put both of them in the same file if I ask. It takes just a second for that Microsoft Word document to open. And then here you can see again, proc core and then the means procedure. And then I could use this table and put it into um, a research paper that I'm writing or on a poster for a conference presentation. Another useful SAS procedure is PROC univariate. PROC univariate gives us descriptive statistics, which we've seen a few times. One of the most important things that it does is it also gives us tests of normality to tell us if a variable is normally distributed. And it also gives us some basic plots. The PROC univariate code looks a lot like other SAS code, where we have PROC univariate telling SAS to use the univariate procedure on the GRIT1 data set here, I ask for normal and plot. What that does is ask for test of normality and some basic plots of the variable. Here, you'll see this test for normality, and it gives me things like Shapiro-Wilk, Kolmogorov-Smirnov, and these are two of the more common tests. So a p-value of greater than 0.05 for these tests tells me that my data is normally distributed. And here I can see a histogram on the left and a box plot on the right that demonstrate that, yes, in fact, my data looks normally distributed. I also get this QQ plot that demonstrates, again, that the data is normally distributed. You'll learn about these Kolmogorov Smirnoff and Shapiro Wilk tests in classes like ESRM 6403. So a learning check for you is to conduct a normality test um, using a different variable. There's several other procedures that will be helpful for you in your classes. Proc reg runs the regression. So you can do a simple or multiple linear regression using proc reg. Proc ANOVA performs ANOVA models. Proc GLM does both and several others. Um, for all of the courses that you're taking and all of the modeling that you want to do, there's probably a SAS procedure for it. And at the end of the presentation, I have some links for some commonly used procedures and tutorials for how to do all of those things. Let's talk about data manipulation and subsetting of our data steps. Data manipulation includes some basic mathematical operations. And we also have a set of statements that we'll look at called set, where, and keep. Let's look at our da a different data set called body data. It has 14 variables and 300 observations. It includes things like age, gender, pulse, um, height, weight, and many other things. Our task now is to create a new variable called BMI. And we want to create a new data set with six variables, age, HDL, LDL, height, weight, and this new variable, BMI. Well, if we look at our data set, we could compute BMI by hand if we wanted to, um, or we could just have SAS create it for us. And we can create a data set where only HDL is less than or equal to 40 milligrams, per DL and LDL is greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per LDL. So to tell SAS something is less than or equal, we're just gonna use LE. To tell SAS that something is greater than or equal, we'll just use GE. This is some slightly more advanced coding, but the ideas are gonna be helpful for you as you manipulate your data sets. It's tempting to create new variables outside of SAS and re then read that data set back into SAS with the new variable. But that, of course, could uh, introduce human error to the computations. Um, and it's just more efficient to do it in SAS once you've already read your data set into SAS. There are all sorts of um, arithmetic and logical operations. We can add, subtract, multiply, divide. We can raise things to an exponent and so many other things in SAS. So the way that we would create this new variable BMI 
is by taking our weight in kilograms and dividing it by the height in meters squared, or centimeters, excuse me. So the way that we would do that in SAS is just typing out the code BMI equals weight divided by height divided by 100, because we went from meters to centimeters. And then the double asterisk tells SAS that we're squaring something. So now I have this new variable called BMI. And then let's say that I want a new data set with only six variables, age, HDL, LDL, height, weight, and BMI. I do that with a keep statement. That's why I'm telling SAS to keep only those variables. And finally, I want to only have a data set with individuals that have less than or equal to 40 HDL and greater than or equal to 100 LDL. That's with a where statement. So let's put that all together. We're going to introduce this new command called set. Remember, we said that a data step creates a new data set. So I'm going to create a data set called subset BD from the set of data called body data. And of course, I would need to import this data set and call it body data. You have this data. We've shared it with you. I'll show you which data set we're talking about. It's this bodydata.xlsx. So let me read that in for you. I'm going to proc import data file equals, just to reinforce the concepts. I've clicked on it once, and then I'm going to copy that path. One important thing to note, and here I'm just going to call it body data, is that if you're trying to import an Excel data set, it cannot be open on your computer while you're trying to import it. That's one of the most common problems when we're trying to import Excel data files. So make sure that that Excel data set is closed before you try to import it. DBMS equals XLSX, because remember, the extension is .XLSX. I'm also going to type replace. Then get names equals yes, and finally run. And here, 300 observations, 14 variables. That's exactly what I'm expecting. So now I'm going to create a data set called body data two, just for short, from the data set body data. And then my commands are to keep only those variables. So I'm going to keep age, HDL, LDL, height, weight, and BMI. And then I want to tell it this where statement. Where is telling SAS the qualifying criteria for the new data set. And then finally, I'm going to have these computations. So I run that, and it says that I went from 300 observations now to only 30. It says there were 30 observations read from the data set where HDL is less than or equal to 40 and LDL is greater than 100. So my new data set, BD2, has 30 observations and six variables. And you can see that I now have this BD2 in my work folder. And I'm just going to double click on it, and we can see our BMI computation, where we have age, HDL, LDL, weight, and height, and this new variable that we computed, BMI. So let's see some simple data visualization approaches. PROC SGPLOT is a very useful procedure. SG stands for statistical graphing and PLOT obviously stands for PLOT. So SGPLOT can be used to create histograms, 
scatter plots, bar graphs, box plots. It's a really flexible procedure. Here I would have proc SG plot data equals grit one, and I can create a histogram of that pretest score. And we'll see a histogram on the right hand side. I can also create a scatter plot. Here I need to tell SAS which variable I want on the X axis and which variable I want on the Y axis. I can also create vertical box plots using the VBOX statement. And if I want a vertical box plot for each category, I would just do slash category equals edu. So this is the end of our SAS workshop. I wanna thank you for participating and engaging with us either in person, online, or through this asynchronous video. I'm going to skip to the end and show you some SAS links. There's a lot of really great SAS resources on the web. Again, as a student, you get access to SAS for Windows for free. If you have a Mac, you can get access to SAS through SAS University Edition. Then you can work on learning a little bit more about SAS. Here are some good SAS resources. The first one is UCLA Statistical Consulting Center, stats.idre.ucla. They have a lot of SAS modules that are very helpful. You can read, after you learn how to read data uh, into SAS, you might want to go through some of the other modules. Penn State also has some really great resources online in their MOOCs, which stands for um, Massive, Massively Open um, Online Courses. And STAT 480 is one of those MOOCs, and you can work through an entire course on learning SAS. Of course, here at the University of Arkansas, we offer tutoring for students in the ESRM courses, and we also provide statistical measurement support services consulting for researchers in the College of Education and Health, Health Professions. If you'd like to learn more about either of those services, you can go to esrm.uark.edu. So I want to say thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing more about your adventures in SAS.